Good afternoon, bonsoir, buenos tardes. My name is Edwige Dantica and I live here in Miami. Thank you, Creative Time, the Art Center, and all of you for being here, but most importantly, for staying. Like Samuel Tomi and others this morning, like Maria Magdalena Campos Pons, I have an ancestor acknowledgement. Last week, we lost an incredible member of our artist and global human community, the playwright, poet, essayist, feminist woman warrior, foremother to me, because we, were, we attended the same college, and I partially, I went to that college because she went there, and Tazaki Shange, who gave us, among other gifts, the iconic choreo poem for colored girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow is enough. The rainbow. <laughs> the rainbow is now yours, Zaki, Ashe, and Presente. So, in the cherished presence of Entazaki Shange and all of our ancestors, I want to spend our brief time together talking to you about caravans and what they might have to teach us as both citizens and artists as we do our best to inhabit these archipelagos, these groups of islands, both body and flesh islands, and soil and dirt islands, while resisting, or at least trying to resist, displacement and violence. I would like to talk to you about caravans. I'm sure you've been hearing a lot about them lately, particularly one making its way across Mexico right now. Depending on who you are and where you get your news, the people in this caravan, as of yesterday, about 3,500 down from 7,000, mostly Central American, Honduras primarily, families, including women and children, traveling on foot, fleeing poverty, gang activity, and one of the highest murder rates in the world. These people are risking everything, including being separated from their children for the mere possibility of a better life. Now, if you get your news from some other sources, you've been told that there's an invasion, an invading horde of diseased people, an assault on US borders coming to attack America. And their arrival, two months from now, demands the immediate deployment of between five thousand and fifteen thousand active duty troops to protect this country's borders. The people in these caravan, these voices led by the President of the United States would have you believe are gang members, drug dealers, when they are not Middle Easterners, which is dog whistle for terrorists. The term caravan though goes back to a late 15th century Persian term, caravan, caravan describing a group of people most likely traders traveling together across the desert or some other hostile region. In the old days, as now, it was the safest way to travel as there is not just strength, but also safety in numbers. The thing is, human beings have been traveling, migrating since the beginning of time. We have always traveled from place to place, looking for better opportunities where they exist. And no matter how many walls are built, that will not change. After all, nature's walls, impassable raging rivers and deadly seas, treacherous mountain ranges, and yes, deserts too, have not stopped migrants from constantly leaving all kinds of places that, as the Somali Kenyan British poet Watson Shire has written, won't let them stay. Zake and everybody else, my first exposure to caravans was as a little girl in Haiti watching American Westerns on television. We call them film cowboy or cowboy movies, and a lot of Westerns had some kind of caravan made up of covered wagons that needed defending from, guess who? The Native Americans who were fighting to keep inhabiting their world as they knew it and were resisting displacement and violence and annihilation. Most of the action scenes in these westerns came from battles fought between the white man and sometimes white women in these caravans. In these westerns, the people in the caravans had guns 
and the Native Americans had bows and arrows and would ultimately end up losing to the firepower and dying in large numbers. My parents and other family members loved watching those Westerns and always assured us when we were mis misguidedly afraid for the white man in these type of films, they assured us that the principal actor or hero, the John Wayne, Ronald Reagan, Clint Eastwood type, that nothing was going to happen to them because in these types of films, the heroes never die. What we didn't realize is that we were cheering for the wrong people. I want now to cheer for the right kind of caravan. I want to cheer for these people who at this rate, when or if they ever make it to the US border, from which they are nearly a thousand miles away, will each possibly have between five and 10 active duty soldiers individually deployed for each of them. Rocks will be considered weapons, the president said yesterday, and rocks as weapons plus invasion equals war. Zake, I want to cheer for this caravan that war has been declared on. I want to cheer for their internationally recognized right based on Article 14 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to seek asylum from persecution where they're coming from. And who will they seek protection from when they are confronted by these US soldiers waiting for them at the border? I want to shout through my computer and our television screen and let them know, if they don't already know it, that they are not alone, that their caravan is part of a much larger caravan that is 68.5 million strong. According to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, we now have the highest levels of displacement on record on this planet. An unprecedented 68.5 million of our fellow human beings worldwide are displaced because of war, economic, environmental, or political instability. Among them, 25.4 million are refugees, over half of whom are under the age of 18 years old. So even as their numbers in this current much talked about caravan dwindles, and some of these people who are walking 30 miles a day, seven days a week, lose their ability to keep going, they are not alone. This notion of a caravan has homelessness and statelessness and general unwantedness. The notion of a caravan of desperate men, women, and children being seen as an invading force has also made me re-ask myself what home is. Hey, as Haitians, we say la caille, c'est la caille, home is home, and that means no matter how challenging things are at home, home is still home. But what if home won't let you stay? We don't always get to decide where we call home. At times, immigration officers, border guards, presidents of the United States decide whether our children sleep in beds or in cages. Tell us, the novelist Toni Morrison said in her 1993 Nobel lecture, what it is to have no home in this place, to be set adrift from the one you knew, what it is to live on the edge of towns that cannot bear your company. Tell us, we might also interpret her as saying, what it is to be part of a caravan today. Whether you're among Europe's most recent migrants, especially those who have been drowning by the thousands in the waters of the Mediterranean Sea, or Dominicans of Haitian descent, who due to a 2013 retreat to a 1929 constitution that takes away birthright citizenship and renders people who were born in that country or have been living there and for generations as people in transit. How long must a caravan be in transit to no longer be a caravan? Can the now 450,000 people from Haiti, Nicaragua, Honduras, and El Salvador, and Sudan, whose lives remain in limbo, even though a judge recently blocked Trump's effort to end temporary protected status for them, can they stop being in transit? Can the 800,000 DACA, Deferred, adult act Deferred Action for Childhood Arrival recipients or dreamers who were brought to the US by their parents as children, can they stop being in transit? If you're a child, a partner, or any type of family member of any of these people, 
then you have also willingly or unwillingly joined a metaphorical caravan that is living every day, as Frantz Fanon would say, with certain uncertainty. Now, what if every time this type of caravan of the marginal and vulnerable, a, 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 a caravan of migrants, what if each time they were maligned, we made up our minds to join a caravan of our own, a caravan of resistors, a caravan of supporters, a caravan that offers sanctuary. I feel when I was thinking about this, I was trying to think of all the caravans that I have been a part of. And one of them was in the 1980s, when I just moved to the United States, when because of 20 cases of Haitians with, um, who were HIV positive here at Jackson Memorial Hospital, cases that were record, recorded to the uh, CDC, Haitians were put on a list of people who were high risk for AIDS, homosexuals, hemophiliacs, Haitians, and heroin addicts. And Haitians were the only ones who were identified by nationality. I had just arrived in the United States and I went to a junior high school where uh, our class was not allowed to go on a field trip to the Statue of Liberty because they were afraid that whatever, that we might be contagious in some way to the other children. And we had, we knew people who wanted to donate blood to sick family members who couldn't donate blood to their own fathers. So Haitians mobilized against this band protesting in large numbers in Washington, D.C., Boston, and Miami. And in April 20, 1990, between 50,000 and 100,000 people marched across the Brooklyn Bridge. We felt the bridge shake that day as if from the weight of our humiliation and rage. I was also part of caravans against police brutality when Youssef Hawkins, Abner Louima, Patrick Dorismont were killed. There were marches in the Haitian and the larger uh, African-American community in New York. We are still doing that marching today. Members of this community in Miami are still marching to keep TPS in spite of the recent ruling. They're still uh, in limbo. Uh, last week, the National TPS Alliance came through Miami and they were at the Little Haiti Cultural Center where some of you might be visiting tomorrow. And they were on a journey for justice caravan across the United States 50 people who were affected by the uh, revocation of TPS who were traveling across the country sharing their stories. Speaking of rainbows, Zaki, in May 13, 2017, we were standing outside the Miami field office of the U.S. Immigration and um, uh, Services with a group, different organizations who were again protesting for TPS, when right in the middle of the demonstration there was a huge circular rainbow in the sky. And I kept thinking of Mahalia Jackson singing, you know, God put a rainbow in the sky. God put a rainbow in the sky. When it looked like the sun was gonna shine no more. Oh, God put a rainbow in the sky. Now you know why I write and don't sing. <laughs> um, um, and the rainbow made me, think of what rainbows are supposed to be. I grew up in church and so rainbows means like we're not gonna die by flood anymore and J James Baldwin says the fire next time. But it seems like I think it's the flood next time because we are at the doorstep of climate change here as Xavier, Car uh, Xavier Cartada said today, 3.26 feet elevation. So people march also here against gentrification um, in little Haiti because this rainbow and the sky has, made, has led to the, uh, the rich pushing the poor out to seek higher ground. And Haiti people are marching to demand accountability for funds from Petro Caribe, the Venezuela purchasing oil and loan program. Cote Cob Petro Caribe, they're saying both on social media and on the streets. Zach Blass spoke this morning about airports and after the Muslim ban in January, we were, uh, friends, writer friends of mine in the community, all different people. We went to Miami International Airport carrying out signs, no human being is illegal. But I was there say, with my sign that said, no human being is illegal, thinking of my uncle Joseph, who in a difficult time in Haiti in 2004, 
came from Haiti with a valid visa and a passport. He was 81 years old, was a cancer survivor, spoke with a voice box, was stopped at Miami International Airport because he said he wanted temporary asylum. He was arrested, put in Chrome Detention Center. His medications were taken away from him. And when he said he was, uh, feel, not, wasn't feeling well at a hearing, the nurse there accused him of, forcing, of faking his illness. And then when he was near death, they took him to Jackson Memorial Hospital in the prison ward, and he died shackled to a bed in the prison ward of that hospital. White supremacists see desperate bodies in motion and transit, especially when they were black and brown, as something akin to biological warfare, welfare. We'll never be able to convince people like this of our own humanity, much less the humanity of people traveling in a caravan. However, those of us who are looking for ways to inhabit an ever-changing world, resist displacement and violence, and want to help others in their struggle to do the same, can learn a few things from these brave men and women who are walking 30 miles a day, seven days a week, and risking everything to take part in these caravans. Three things I thought we could learn from them are as followed. The first thing is that stories must be shared. Stories about the difficulties of the past as well as uh, the possibilities of the future. I am a writer because I believe so strongly in this. And I think even the people who are at taking risk in these caravans, who are sharing their stories with reporters, are in small ways negating the fact that they're being painted as terrorists. When a mother is changing a diaper as she's telling her story of running away from a gang, if people want to believe what they still believe, they can, but at least that story is still out there. The second thing we can learn from these folks, I think, just in these caravans, not just in these caravans, but in many others, is that as the Haitian national anthem says, l'union fait la force, or in unity there is strength. There is strength, even not always um, completely, and safety in numbers, but at least there are more witnesses when we have larger numbers. Those of us who are trying to inhabit this current version of this particular world and are trying to resist displacement and violence, we need to put aside some turf wars, pull our voices and skills together, form alliances, and build coalitions. We need to start practicing what in Haiti we called combit, which is basically, today you work my land, tomorrow I work yours. The writer Jacques Romain, whose seminal novel of Haiti was translated by Langston News, who was a, a great friend of his, said, cooperation is the friendship of the poor. Sometimes coalition is the friendship of the desperate. We must offer sanctuary, or as Gwendolyn Brooks put it in a poem that she wrote for Paul Robeson, we are each other's harvest, we are each other's business. We are each other's harvest. We are each other's business. The th third thing we can learn, I think, is perseverance. Imagine how much perseverance it takes to walk 30 miles a day, seven days a week, sometimes with a small child in your arms, or to take to the high seas in an overcrowded boat with your whole family with you, sometimes generations of that family. You do this because you feel as though you absolutely have no choice. You do this because, as Warson Shire wrote in her poem, you do it because home won't let you stay, just as home would not let my uncle stay. Part of persevering is sometimes just putting one foot in front of the other. And these times might make us all feel frozen and overwhelmed, but just take one step. I'm exhausted, you said, I am tired. And sometimes when you're walking for long distances, you get tired and risk lying down and giving up at some point. You think your pain and your heartbreak are unprecedented in the history of the world, James Baldwin wrote, but then you read. And I hasten to add, and I dare to add to the great man's words, or you see, or you witness, or you observe, or you write, or you paint, or you sing, or you dance, or you join some kind of caravan, or create one of your own. Zake, like the weeping angels Elvis Fuentes talked about earlier today, from our archipelago, 
the Tainos believe themselves to have originally been cave people who would turn into stone when touched by sunlight. They knew the risk when they stepped into the light, but they did it anyway to create a new world, a world that continues to exist because we are still here. Don't turn your back, don't look away, don't blink, as Elvis said, as you imagine about a borderless future, don't blink, walk, keep walking, inside or outside of a caravan, keep walking as though you have the right to exist, as though you have every right to be here. I want to give the final words to Entezaki Shange from her collection of poems, From Okra to Greens. Rise up, fallen fighters, she wrote, unfetter the stars, dance with the universe, and make it yours. Thank you.